CNN may never be the same again after President Donald Trump appeared at the network. The show lasted over an hour. It ended with the live audience of Republicans and undeclared voters at the St. Aslam College in New Hampshire actually cheering for Trump. And they were not cheering as much for the interviewer, Caitlin Collins. Immediately after, CNN itself was actually attacked by several public figures and establishment news outlets for even giving Trump a platform. It's election season again, and folks, Trump is back. But Politico was also right. This was not just a regular interview for Trump. For him, it was really something that's likely done more to boost his chances at winning the next election than anything that's happened over the last couple years. And why is that? Well, it showed the public, yet again, that Trump is who he is. It humanized him. And humanizing Trump is absolutely destructive to the agenda that's been at play. Now, look, I remember when I was in school, we learned about war propaganda. We were shown posters used by various countries in World War I and World War II. The purpose of war propaganda was often to dehumanize the enemy. The enemy would often be painted as monsters. They'd be painted as animals, as vicious threats. The idea of this was to personify them as something else, to strip them of their humanity. Now, for war, there are some who argue that's necessary. It helps people feel more justified to fight, and in the case of war, to even kill their enemies. And again, when they feel their enemies are not human. Flashback to 2016, folks. Trump was just about to take office as President of the United States after facing what is the ongoing media attacks that define pretty much his entire time in office and still are happening right now as we speak. Well, back then, Tonight Show host Jimmy Fallon invited Trump to appear on his program, and people were shown an image of Trump that the media otherwise avoided showing. It was Trump being himself. And Fallon was immediately criticized by the establishment for, quote, humanizing Trump. Let me show you a clip from that show. I don't, it, this is getting real. This is, yeah, it's yeah. getting real. I uh, you, you still have time. Do you still want to do this? I mean, there's time. I mean, you, you... We're, uh, we're doing well. It's been really a lot of fun, and it's uh, an amazing movement all over the country. It's been incredible. So, no, it's been an honor for me, I That's have it. to say. Go ahead, with my hair spray. <laughs> Now that clip, folks, the New York Times made that into a scandal. It declared in, the, in May 17th of 2017 that, quote, Jimmy Fallon was on top of the world, then came Trump. And in an interview with the publication, Fallon actually apologized. In particular, he apologized for the act that allegedly humanized Trump, the man that would be president of the United States. And what did Fallon do? Well, as you saw, he ruffled Trump's hair. Fallon told the publication this, I didn't do it to humanize him. I almost did it to minimize him. I didn't think it would be a compliment. Now, folks, why would it be wrong to compliment Trump? What's wrong with ruffling someone's hair? What's wrong with making someone look like a human being? Well, what's wrong with that? is it's damaging to the propaganda that's designed to do the exact opposite, to dehumanize someone, to strip them of their humanity, and to make it appear that it's justified to hate them. Now, back to that war propaganda. Take Japan as an example. During World War II, they were an Axis power. Propaganda painted them as monsters, and the dehumanization of them was even used to justify the use of nuclear weapons. When the war came to an end and the rebuilding began, people again started seeing through the propaganda. They again started seeing, started seeing what were, you know, really we're all just people. For Japan, it was mainly entertainment and movies that began to change things. In fact, one of my favorite directors, Akira Kurosawa, he was applauded as having played a strong role in that. Movies like Seven Samurai, you know, in fact, the plots of some of these films were later used in some of the more famous Western films like The Magnificent, like the Magnificent Seven. And folks, people were able to see that maybe we're not so different. You know, maybe 
we're all just human. And back to the recent town hall with Trump. It appears that this is again back just like 2016 and 2017. CNN is being criticized for doing that. Well, that and the fact that Trump is yet again stating things that the establishment narrative doesn't like. It's the argument of disinformation and on what we should or should not be allowed to say on TV. Representative Ocasio-Cortez reacted to to the town hall on Twitter and she stated that CNN should be ashamed of themselves. They have lost total control of this town hall to again be manipulated into platform election disinformation, defenses of January 6th, and a public attack on a sexual abuse victim. The audience is cheering him on and laughing at the host. So what should CNN be ashamed of? Ashamed really for interviewing the leading presidential candidate for the Republicans? When has it ever been considered controversial to interview a leading political candidate? Now, last I checked, we're still living in a constitutional republic. We still have an election system. That election system lets people like us choose who they vote for, to choose their leaders. And how is it irresponsible to give one of the leading candidates for that a voice? The reality is that what used to be considered normal is now called abnormal. What was once considered abnormal is being pushed as the new normal. And in a very subtle or not so subtle way, the establishment has acknowledged something important. They've been running a very focused propaganda campaign. And folks, that propaganda campaign is once again failing. Let me show you a few clips of how that that event went. The Constitution says it was supposed to have legal and well-maintained and well-looked-at elections, and we didn't have that. I cherish our Constitution, but we have to live up to the Constitution. We weren't living up to the Constitution. I was just saying there's no evidence of that election fraud. You did once tweet. You're supposed to say that, but, you know, I'm glad you say that. But, look, that was a horrible election. That was a horrible election, and unless somebody's very stupid, and I know you very well, you're not stupid at all, Uh, but you perhaps are given an agenda or you have an agenda. Look, we have to have honest elections in our country. Now, that interviewer kept trying to press Trump, claiming the election was not stolen. And Trump continued by listing what took place in various states on the many irregularities and bad practices that were seen. They then jumped to a question, and here's how that went. Will you suspend polarizing talk of election fraud during your run for president? Yeah, unless I see election fraud. If I see election fraud, I think I have an obligation to say it. And you know what we went through uh, a short while ago has really put our country in a big problem. Uh, I hope to do that. I hope we're going to have very honest elections. Uh, We should have voter ID. We should have one-day elections. We should have paper ballots instead of these mail-in votes. But uh, the answer is yes, and I hope that it's going to be very straight up, because if it's going to be straight up, we're going to win the election. So you will suspend talk to his question about the 2020 election on the campaign trail? I guess we're going to just win. We're at a point now. We're getting so close. Let's just win it again and straighten out our country. One other question on this. Now, as that interview went on, they actually touched on many, really mainly on the controversies with Trump. They went story by story through the scandals and the charges and the allegations. And Trump actually handled them in a very, let's say, Trumpian way. Take, for example, his reaction to the allegations around January 6th. One of the big problems was that Nancy Pelosi, Crazy Nancy, as I affectionately call her, (laughs) Crazy Nancy Pelosi and the mayor of Washington were in charge, as you know, of security. And they did not do their job. They're not in charge of the National Guard. You're in charge of the National Guard. Well, I offered them National Guard. I said, we'll give you soldiers, we'll give you National Guard, we'll give you whatever you want. And they turned me down. Now, do you see that change in narrative? They're in charge of security. They're not in charge of the National Guard. That wasn't what Trump was talking about. Trump was, of course, fact-checked on this. The interviewer accused him several times of not stating accurate information. And other news outlets also claimed he was not honest. But in reality, Trump was talking about who was in charge of security. Nancy Pelosi had some authority over the Capitol Police. Muriel Bowser had some authority over D.C. Metro. 
and neither placed proper security at the Capitol on January 6. On the note of National Guard, Trump does not have and did not have the authority to deploy the National Guard. The president only has the authority to authorize the deployment. And Trump did authorize the deployment. But that deployment was not approved by Pelosi and others in charge. As you can see, the establishment media is once again not being quite accurate.